Hi guys, Harry here. Welcome to Scrap Science. What we're going to be doing today uh, is turning this sample of potassium iodide, which I bought uh, from eBay uh, from China, evidently. We're going to be turning that into elemental iodine. Now there are two normal ways someone would go about doing this. Um, first of all, you might make a solution of the potassium iodide and then react it with um, concentrated sulfuric acid, which will liberate um, pure elemental iodine as a vapor and as a solid that settles to the bottom of your beaker. The other way, of course, is to mix it with hydrochloric acid and then add hydrogen peroxide in order to oxidize the iodide ions into iodine. I never know whether to call it iodine or iodine, but anyway, it doesn't matter. The basic idea is to make a solution of our potassium iodide and then acidify it and add an oxidizer and that will oxidize our iodide ions. If we did it in neutral or basic conditions, uh, it would tend to form uh, iodate or periodate instead of elemental iodine, uh, and hence why acidic conditions are used to oxidize the ion. Now I don't have uh, concentrated sulfuric acid and I don't have very much hydrogen peroxide. Both of those things are pretty tricky to get for me. Uh, concentrated sulfuric acid is basically impossible uh, aside from distilling dilute sulfuric acid and hydrogen peroxide is very expensive here. I'm currently working on a video about the synthesis of hydrogen peroxide from air and water uh, but you know, that might work, it might not. We'll get to that in a future video. So as far as oxidizers go, I don't really have many options for this reaction. And no doubt you've probably seen previously on YouTube a whole bunch of videos uh, similar to the two methods of generating iodine that I mentioned before. Wouldn't be anything new for me to do it. So for our method of oxidizing the iodide ions here, we're going to look back a few episodes of Scrap Science ago when we made bromine by a very similar method to what we're going to be doing here. We had sodium bromide and we acidified it and then we oxidized it by electrolysis, of course, as always. The oxidizer in this case uh, is the anode of our electrolytic cell. Um, I'll go over that a little bit later, um, but what that should do is similar to how we made our elemental bromine. I still have that bromine. Uh, I'll go and get it a bit later. Basically, our anode of our electrolytic cell should oxidize our iodide to the elemental state. Uh, it should be even easier than when we made bromine because iodide is a stronger reducer than bromide and thus it should be uh, a lot easier to oxidize it to its elemental state. Also iodine itself along with triiodide uh, is a weaker oxidizer than bromine and tribromide so the back reduction on the cathode uh, should be minimal compared to how it was when we were making bromine. So it should be both easier and more efficient than when we were making bromine from sodium bromide. Electricity, of course, is also very cheap, at least on a small scale when compared to other oxidizers like hydrogen peroxide or concentrated sulfuric acid. So that's good too. Anyway, let's get started. So here I've measured out around 20 grams of our potassium iodide and here I've weighed out around about 18 grams of sodium bisulfate which will act to um, acidify our potassium iodide. We want approximately the same number of moles of potassium iodide as we have uh, sodium bisulfate, uh, slight excess of the acid just in case miraculously the reaction goes to completion. Uh, we still want to have excess acid to make sure that our iodide is being oxidized to iodine rather than iodate or periodate. And we'll now go ahead and dissolve up our sodium bisulfate with a bit of distilled water and then add our potassium iodide. All right, finally everything is dissolved in a little bit over 100 milliliters of water. That took forever because it is very cold today and I didn't bother heating up the solutions to get the salts to dissolve quicker, but it's done now. Um, what we're going to do is just transfer this solution uh, into our electrolytic cell. All right, now that it's all in the cell, I'll explain what's going on here. You can see I've filled it up 
uh, with our solution and then added a little bit more distilled water such that our copper cathode, which I've kind of bent into a ring shape here, I've got the cathode sitting uh, very close to the surface of the water. And the reason for this is because the iodine is a lot denser than the water and it's going to probably sink to the bottom of the cell. And we want to keep the cathode as far away from the iodine as possible uh, because if it's touching it, it's much more likely to reduce it back to the iodide ion. If you're going to be trying this yourself, just know that any uh, electrode will work as the cathode provided that the metal that you use, uh, or graphite for that matter, is resistant to uh, the non-oxidizing mineral acids. I always just go for copper because it's nice and simple, it's resistant to the acid and it works very well. And then finally we get to the anode, which I've put together here as just a, a row of carbon electrodes. Um, there are only two electrodes that will work as the anode in this case. Uh, similar to when we made bromine, it's basically just carbon, as I've got here, or pure platinum metal, which I doubt very many people actually have. Basically any metal, including uh, titanium-based anodes, uh, will get eaten up by the strong acid in this cell. So uh, it's basically just graphite or carbon uh, that we can use for this. Anyway, we're just about ready to hook this up to the power supply, so I'll put this back into the box to contain spills and we'll turn it on. All right, everything's connected up. I've got a PC power supply uh, supplying 12 volts out of here to my new um, buck converter here, which should let me uh, control the voltage and current that we put through the cell. And I've got this hooked up to our cell. So if I turn it on, set it to a nice low voltage to start off with, we should see, ready, a bunch of hydrogen coming off the cathode and nothing on the anode. And that's exactly what we want to see because the iodine forming uh, shouldn't produce any gas. You can see we've got a nice low voltage of a bit under 3 volts and current of a bit under 0.4 amps. And that's steadily dropping as possibly the anode gets covered in non-conductive iodine. But we should be able to raise the voltage later to fix that. I might set up the camera so you can see the iodine coming off that electrode or at least the triiodide. Uh, let's do that now. Cool. Alrighty, that time lapse went for a little over half an hour. First half an hour of the running of the cell. We've had it running for about... Um, about an amp for the last 15 minutes. I turned it up so that we could actually get something on the time lapse because it didn't seem to be doing anything. But the bottom of the beaker is now very black, and I suspect that's just concentrated triiodide. But just in case it is elemental iodine uh, evolving at a much faster rate than I thought, I'm just going to turn it off, pull the electrodes out, and get a good look at whatever we've made so far. Alrighty, this process is working a lot better than I expected. You can see down the bottom of this beaker here, there is a whole bunch, just after half an hour of running the cell, at about an average of three quarters of an amp, we have a whole bunch of sediment at the bottom of the beaker. It's really hard to see through this really dark solution, but we do have what I think is elemental iodine, and we have quite a bit of it. The only other thing it could be is just carbon dust falling off the electrode, but the electrode looks pretty fine. I mean, it's covered in what I can only assume is elemental iodine. Um, I think it's working very well, very quickly. I might restart the cell. Got the cell running at about half an amp. I might even turn that down later overnight uh, until tomorrow morning when we'll extract the elemental iodine. And you can see this is the rag that I used to position the anode on. You can see a whole bunch of what can only be iodine uh, that just soaked into this paper. And that's looking very good. So I'm going to leave this as is. I mean, I'll come back to check on it periodically for the rest of the day. I'm going to leave it going like this, maybe at a lower current until tomorrow morning. And I'll see you then when we will extract everything. All right, we're back. It's been about 20 hours since uh, we started running the cell. 
you can see it's still running very nicely. The electrodes haven't fallen apart or anything. Um, last night I left it running at approximately 0 0.16, 0 0.17 amps overnight just because um, we actually made most of our iodine in the first couple of hours of running the cell and then it seemed to kind of run out of iodide to turn into iodine so I kind of left it at a low amperage just to make sure that the carbon electrode doesn't fall apart too much and contaminate our iodine with carbon powder but I definitely think that we're pretty much done now the solution you can't really see but it's a lot clearer than it was when it was saturated with um, triiodide so I think what we'll do is I'll turn off the cell I'll take out uh, the beaker, take out the electrodes, and we'll have a look at what we've got. There we are, got the cathode here. Uh, looks perfectly fine, just a couple of wires, it's gone a little bit black, but uh, it hasn't fallen apart or anything, as we'd expect. The anode has done remarkably well. You can see the carbon is pretty much untouched throughout the entire electrode. If we have a look at the cell, uh, it looks like we have it's tricky to see on camera, but it looks like we have quite a bit of iodine, really. It looks like the iodine is piled up at the bottom of the beaker all the way up to round about here. Sadly, I think uh, a lot of that iodine is uh, mixed up with some sodium sulfate that crystallized out because the reaction as it gets rid of hydrogen ions in solution uh, on the cathode generating hydrogen gas uh, the concentration of just sodium sulfate increases quite a bit and because it was so cold last night and it's so cold now um, the sodium sulfate I assume has crystallized out and we do definitely have iodine because uh, last night as we were generating a little bit of iodine I wiped some off uh, this anode here here's the original sample so this was yesterday hasn't evaporated yet and then today you can see that same piece of paper that had the iodine on it. Uh, most of it has sublimated, which is exactly what we'd expect from elemental iodine. So we can be very sure that we have made at least some quantity of iodine. So what I think we can do uh, to get rid of the majority of the sodium sulfate that's crystallized out and any acid in solution that's still in there, uh, we will go ahead and filter off the top layers of the water here and then I also have um, some nice warm water that will do a couple of washings uh, of the iodine in the beaker here with. I'll just do a couple of washings uh, with some warm water to get rid of the sodium sulfate. And there we go, that is our still slightly wet iodine. Um, it looked like we had a lot more when it was in the cell but that's okay, this is still more than enough for what I need. I'll go ahead, stick this on some paper towels to dry it out, and then we might even have a go at purifying it by uh, sublimation. That looks dry enough to me. Uh, what we're gonna do now is transfer it into uh, this beaker. We'll put that on the hot plate, stick this on top, and hopefully uh, we will be able to sublimate our iodine and get it to deposit as crystals on the bottom of this beaker, which we will then store in an ampule, hopefully. Look at it go, beautiful. You can already see it crystallizing on the sides of the beaker there. That's nice. Yep, a few minutes later, there's a little bit of water down there boiling away, but for the most part, I can't really see in there, but we're getting a, quite a few crystals, I would imagine, on this top beaker. We'll let it go to completion and then I'll uh, transfer the iodine crystals into this beaker down here and then we'll go ahead and do our best to try to put it in an ampule uh, just like we did with the bromine here. That, that is very purple. Cool. Just while that's still hot, we'll take it off. Nice, look at all that. See if we can transfer it over here. Now we have iodine crystals. Not many and not much, but we do have them. 
I've now transferred the iodine into a test tube. There's really not much anymore. What I'm going to do is, as I did with the bromine, I'm going to see if I can seal this in an ampule. Uh, I won't film me doing that because I'll need both hands and I've made a video on ampuling before so you don't need to see it again. And there we are. Uh, that went way better than I expected. We were able to seal it off very easily and have a very nice seal at the top there. So that's our ampule of iodine. Uh, there's not quite as much in there as it looks. It tends to stick to the walls. I think there's a little bit of water left in there, but that's okay. It's still very pure iodine. And there it is sitting next to the bromine ampule we made before. That's two out of the five halogens done. Um, I guess there's only one more that we'd really be comfortable working with uh, to add to our what's now our halogen collection. Uh, maybe we'll, in the future, we'll make an ampule of uh, chlorine as well. That'll be a nice little set. And yep, uh, that is that. Um, we probably got less than a gram of iodine in the end. Uh, we got maybe two grams all up from the actual electrolysis and everything and then I probably lost a whole gram due to sublimation and transferring it between the steps and the uh, purification step. But obviously the yield of this electrochemical process is very, very poor. So I definitely wouldn't recommend anyone else try it. If you want to make iodine uh, and you have any oxidizer like hydrogen peroxide, concentrated sulfuric acid or chlorine or something, I would definitely go with that because you'll get more iodine out of it and uh, it'll be much easier. That being said, I did probably stop the electrolysis quite a way before it was done. I mean, obviously there were still uh, bubbles of hydrogen off the cathode and uh, there was no oxygen coming off the anode, so it was still making iodine. However, I thought we had quite a bit in the cell and it turns out we didn't. Uh, so maybe running the cell for longer or at a higher current density might or probably will uh, actually result in more iodine. But whatever, much easier to go with peroxide if you can get it. And with that said, I uh, think we're done. See you later.